Well, what an interesting day it's been. Kind of an interesting couple of weeks, huh? I'm glad that you came tonight. Tonight's so different than what we had planned. It's okay. Uh, Dave Grimm is going to be speaking tonight in our family series, and uh, we're going to postpone that for a week or two, and we'll let you know, or you'll know on a Sunday night when he's up, and uh, we're going to continue that series just tonight because of the circumstances with the weather. We're just kind of... Uh, following the leading of the Holy Spirit and just want to do something that would honor him. So I want to just talk to you tonight about praise, about being a, a worshiper, about living a life of praise, the way of a worshiper. One of the people that I so um, respect as far as a worshiper in Scripture is Paul. Acts chapter 16, there's uh, the story of Paul and he and Silas were arrested because they had cast a demon out of a girl and uh, hadn't really broken a law, but because of uh, what happened there, you know, they were, they were turned in and uh, it says that they were stripped, they were beaten with rods. After being severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And uh, after, you know, besides the severe beating that they, that they took, it says that they were fastened into stocks where their arms and their legs were clamped into an immobile position, uh, which would have caused all kinds of cramping and loss of circulation. The atmosphere of prison, uh, not the atmosphere of prison that we think of today, but the prison in the day was a dun more like a dungeon. Very dark, very damp, a stench-ridden place. And so here we find Paul and Silas thrown into prison, not committing a crime. But in spite of what they were facing, the, the atmosphere, the, depress, the depressing atmosphere, uh, in spite of the throbbing pain in their bodies, Paul and Silas, uh, it says that we, we hear them worshiping and praising God. What you would most likely hear at the place where they are at in the, in the heart of this dungeon prison would have been moaning and groaning and wailing because that's, that was the, the atmosphere. Um, but here were Paul and Silas praying, and they were singing praise to God. And the scripture records that there was a sound, a strange sound. A, the sound of Paul and Silas worshiping was a strange sound that the other prisoners heard. Um, because, like I said, they were only used to hearing the groans and wailing and moaning of the other prisoners. And it says that suddenly, a violent earthquake shook the place. And as this earthquake shook the prison, it says that the doors of the prison flew open and the stocks and all that they found themselves in were, were loosed. Their chains had come loose, uh, not only of Paul and Silas, but every prisoner in, in the prison. It's an amazing uh, event. There are some amazing events that take place in the Bible. You go on to read in that story and uh, come to find out the jailer ends up giving his life to, uh, to the Lord. You know, he's going, I'm, I'm done. What, and then he ends up saying to Paul, what must I do to be saved just because of all this? It was an event that, that caught his attention. But what I want to focus on is Paul and Silas, they knew the secret of worshiping and praising God. They knew the secret of how to lift their hearts, even in times of trouble. They lifted their praise. They entered into the presence of God and, and into the power of God. Psalm 22.3 says that God inhabits the praises of his people. It actually says it like this. He is enthroned on the praises of Israel. Maybe another way to say that is that God dwells in the atmosphere of his praise. And this is a, a, a statement that I want you to remember tonight. That praise isn't merely a reaction or a response from coming into the presence of God. How do we define praise? What is, what is that? Oftentimes, we will define it by, you know, this is a response to who, to who God is. But really what I think is that praise is a vehicle that brings us into the power and into the presence of God. It's not just our reaction or our response. It's the, it's the pass, so to speak. It's the ticket, the gate pass uh, to entering into his presence. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. In Matthew chapter 18, it records this verse. It says, Where two or, 
or, or three, gather in my name, Jesus said, there I am with them. The presence of God coming into his courts with singing and into his presence with praise. More than the fact that God is with us. The Bible says he is Emmanuel, he's God with us. Over and over through scripture we see uh, him, him saying that he would be with us wherever he goes. He said that to Moses. He, he made that statement to Joshua a couple of times. He, he told um, the disciples the Great Commission, Matthew 28, I'll be with you to the very end of the, uh, very end of the earth. So we know this omnipotent presence of God that's everywhere. There's nowhere scripture says that we can go where we can get away from his presence. But yet we have this scripture in Matthew 18 that says where two or three gather in my name, there I am. So it's, it's something greater than Emmanuel, God with us. It's something greater than just his omnipotent presence where we can't get away from him. He's everywhere. But wherever two or three gather in his name, and I know we might be few tonight, but there's at least two. There's more than three. And we've gathered here in his name. And what happens where two or three gather in his name like this, he manifests his presence. It's not just something to know that he's with us, but he manifests his presence. It becomes obvious and evident and apparent. To gather in his name means that he's the focus. He's the center of attention. He's the center of it all. He's the one that is preached about. He's the one that's sung about. He's the one that's praised, and he's the one that's worshiped. Hebrews 2.12 says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. So some think that worship is the response after the Holy Spirit moves on them. But I believe that uh, praise is really in God's presence responds when we call upon him. It's a vehicle that brings us into his presence. It invites his presence and his power to flow in our midst. And so, you know, we, we, we just sang a couple of songs. Our response, is it just, I'm responding because I love this song, I'm responding because that makes me feel good, I'm responding because that message, I like that, I like what that says to me, or is it just that I'm choosing and making a choice, a decision that I'm gonna praise God and I'm seeking after him and I'm seeking after his presence. What does it mean to praise? Praise means to commend. We know that. To applaud. To magnify. So as believers in Jesus, praise to God is an expression of worship. It's, it's lifting him up. It's glorifying him. It's humbling ourselves and focusing our attention on him. It magnifies our awareness of our relationship with him. There are a whole lot of different actions or postures that are involved with worship. Praise to God it could be verbal expressions of thanksgiving. It could be singing. It could be playing of instruments, shouting, dancing, lifting our hands, clapping our hands, kneeling, bowing, laying prostrate before him, being silent. There is a whole lot of postures and responses of worship. But one thing that worship isn't, true worship, isn't just going through the motions. Jesus addressed the, uh, the Pharisees. Um, they're... Their worship was an outward response, but it wasn't from their heart. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about worship, and we looked at Malachi, and, and their worship, they were just kind of going through the motions. They were content and complacent just doing the things that they had always done. And what had happened in doing all the things that they had always done, they started beginning to uh, bring less and less. They started giving God their leftovers, do we, do we just want to go through the motions? Or do we want an encounter with God? See, genuine praise is a, is a matter of humility. It's devoting ourselves to the Lord from our hearts. Sincere praise is what pleases God. That's what he desires most. John 4.23 says, True worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they're the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. So praise is really, it's a lifestyle. It's not just something we do when we gather together like this. It's not just something that we do when we turn on music uh, in our cars. 
Because if worship and praise is something that we do when we gather here at church, when we leave, what happens? When we leave this event, when we leave this place, it's not just something we do when we gather together. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's, it's our daily life. It's what we do in our, in our work. It's what we do in, in the car. It's what we do at our home. It's wherever we are. The psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Praise is an expression of faith. It's, it's our declaration of victory. It's saying that we believe that God is with us. We believe that God is in control uh, of the outcome and the circumstances of our life. Do we truly believe that he is in control? Do we truly believe that he is determining and helping and working toward the outcome of all the different circumstances in our life? Do we truly believe what Paul said in Romans eight twenty eight? We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Do we believe that? If we can believe that way and live that way, then we're living and we're beginning to live a life of praise. Praise is something that we offer to God. Not just because we feel like it or not just when we feel like it. It's something that we do even if we don't feel like it. Scripture talks about it as a, a sacrifice. Something that we do because we believe in him and we want to please him. Hebrews thirteen fifteen says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. So praise manifests God's presence. Not only does it manifest his presence, it repels the enemy. And that's, that's significant too. Not only does it bring his presence and makes us more aware of his presence, our praise will repel the enemy. The enemy fears the name of Jesus. Scripture tells us that he flees the presence of the Lord. An atmosphere that's filled with sincere worship and praise to God by those whose hearts are humble and repentant, it's, it's something that's disgusting to the enemy. And that's the way I want to be perceived. I want, I want my life to be disgusting to, to, the, to the enemy. I want him to have to run and flee. And that's the presence of the Lord. Second Chronicles chapter 20 says that the children of Judah, they were, they were outnumbered and there was a host of armies that surrounded them. Uh, people from Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, and King Jehoshaphat and all his people, they sought the Lord for his help. And this is the prayer that they prayed in, in, in 2 Chronicles twenty twelve. They said, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We don't know what to do. You ever been in a place like that? And your prayer was, God, I have no idea what to do. This is the prayer. They're surrounded by thousands of people of the other army, and they're going, what are we going to do? We have no idea what to do, but our eyes are on you. That was their prayer. And so he assured them that the battle was not theirs, but the battle was his, and that if they, as they went out to fight against this enemy, that he would do the fighting for them. So what did they do? What do the people of Judah do? What does Judah mean? Do you know what Judah means? Praise. The word Judah means praise. So these were the people of praise. That's, that's what they did. God manifests his power and his presence through praise. And so this is what they did. They set their worshipers ahead of the soldiers and they went out to battle and they were led by the praisers. They were led by the worshipers. So they went ahead, these worshipers went ahead declaring these words. <coughs> they said, <coughs> that's not what they said. They didn't choke at all. They didn't choke. Let me look it up here. Second Chronicles. It says that they, they, they went ahead declaring, praise the Lord for his love endures forever. And the scripture says that when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, and they literally defeated each other. Verse 22, as they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, 
who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. And after finishing slaughtering the men from Mount Seir, they helped to destroy one another. That's, that's what God does. Do you want him fighting your battles for you? Live a life of praise. Be a worshiper. Respond not to his presence to bring praise to you, but decide and determine that you're going to praise that brings the presence of God, that sets the enemy fleeing. I want to invite the worship team to come back, and we're going to just spend some time doing that. And tonight I have no idea what they have planned from this point on. I don't. I didn't know I'd be sharing a, a message tonight. I just didn't. But I believe that it's, it's, it's timely for us to always be reminded that God is for us. Not only is he with us, he's for us. And that as we set our determination to be a, a, a worshiper, to have a heart of worship, to, to praise, not just something that we do when we come to this room, not just something we do when we're together with other people, but that's something that I'm going to do with my life in everything that I do, that I will praise God. And I will see the presence of God be manifested wherever I am. I want to see God do things like he did here with the Israelites. I want to see God fighting my battles for me. I want to see God doing things that I couldn't do for myself. God can do so much and so far beyond what we could ever do for ourselves. So much and so far beyond anything that we can imagine. Let's be worshipers. Let's be the ones to give praise in all circumstances, that his praise would continually be in, in our mouth. Father, I pray that we would have the heart of a worshiper, the heart of praise. God, to worship you and to honor you and to put you in that place where we say, God, we trust you with every area of our life. And we will give you praise no matter what we see, just as, as King Jehoshaphat said, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. May that be the prayer of our heart every day of our life. God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are fixed on you, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of my faith. We trust you, God. Tonight, God, as we continue to worship you, would you just bring your presence? Would you minister to each person here? God, I don't know what everyone's facing, but I know that you're the God of victory that you're the answer. Fight our battles. Bring the victory as we look to you and trust you. In Jesus' name.